Okay, so um, this morning I want to start uh, addressing the topic of uh, functional safety. Uh, this will bring us uh, to the justification of the ISO 26262 content that we will uh, start analyzing probably from the next uh, lectures. Today I want to stay on the basic concept of functional safety to illustrate you what can go wrong when a uh, software system fails, which are the possible outcome of this uh, failure and uh, we will spend some time analyzing a use case that is pretty famous. Uh, we will see together what happened um, a few years ago that resulted in a, in a significant case history for the automotive industry. <coughs> Sorry. Um, this uh, use case, besides presenting the problem, will also illustrate some uh, uh, pitfalls in the design process that has been uh, uh, used for uh, uh, developing the system that we are about to start analyzing. And this uh, give us some hints about what can be improved uh, in order to avoid uh, in the future to uh, do the same mistakes. So here is the outline of this uh, block of slides. Uh, there, are there is plenty of material here, so we are not going to see everything today. Otherwise, uh, uh, it will be in a rush and uh, there will be some issue, I, I imagine. Uh, so we will focus on uh, software uh, diffusion first. This is uh, to reinforce what uh, I said uh, in the first lecture. And then uh, we will uh, focus into software failures. I plan to do these things only uh, today. Um, then uh, in the next lecture, we will start looking into the ISO 26262. And uh, we will do some uh, an example as a um, conclusion of this block of slides. As I said, uh, this is not going to be exhausted today. It will take, I think, uh, three weeks uh, to go through this material, okay? So let me start with the software diffusion. Uh, well, you are pretty young, uh, so you haven't experienced the, the beginning of the computer era, uh, of the personal computer era, I would say. Um, but, uh, so let me just recap a few things uh, that uh, you may remember from uh, pictures that you have seen on Wikipedia. Uh, when uh, computers started to appear on the market, they were uh, very huge machines, very expensive, very unreliable. So this uh, kind of machine was used only for uh, military system, uh, scientific computation, uh, or for uh, managing, uh, uh, I would say, very expensive systems that could afford the cost of such kind of machines. Think about uh, an insurance company that has to uh, manage all Europe or, or uh, uh, all of a continent. Um, think about banks uh, that are spread in the territory. Uh, all in those cases, uh, uh, the amount of uh, money generated by the activity justified the expense for a computer. Then, uh, uh, as uh, Moose Law said, uh, with the introduction of uh, semiconductors, we have seen a, a dramatic drop of the cost of uh, computers, and uh, we have seen, uh, um, in parallel, a dramatic increase in the performance of these computers. So, what we had, we had uh, cost that were uh, that was going down uh, every 18 months. Uh, we had uh, the number of transistors and thus the performance of the computer that were doubling every 18 months. And uh, this was kind of geometric expansion of the semiconductor industry uh, brought us to what we where we are today. So we have computers that are very cheap. If you look on the web, you can see the uh, the announcement of Raspberry Pi 3. That's a device that costs 35 euros. It is a 64-bit device with 1.2 gigahertz of clock frequency, and it is a multi-core. This is impressive. Sooner or later, you will uh, find these kind of devices in the Easter eggs. So uh, they are becoming really, 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 really cheap and small and uh, power efficient. So they are deployed uh, everywhere. And these days we are facing a new revolution because uh, we have computers everywhere, we have uh, connectivity everywhere, and so 
we have a big cloud that is uh, where we are living today, where uh, everybody is connected, every device is connected, your refrigerator is connected, so if for some reason the power fails and so the fridge starts uh, 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 melting and then uh, uh, the, the, the stuff, the, the energy comes back again and so the stuff on the fridge starts freezing again. Well, you have a risk of bacteria there and so the fridge will be able to tell you there was something wrong with the power. Um, and so on and so forth. You may have uh, your, uh, your plants in the house that, uh, uh, as in my case, uh, you forget uh, and so the, the risk of uh, uh, dying, and uh, you may have uh, the container of the plant that sends you an SMS saying, oh, it's time for uh, giving me some water because uh, I'm starving. So uh, this is where we are living today. So computers are everywhere. Indeed, uh, the, def the diffusion of computers uh, can be found uh, in embedded systems, Think about uh, the digital camera that you have or the smartphone that all of you have. Uh, there is a computer there. Think about uh, industrial systems. Today, you cannot uh, even imagine of building a new factory without the usage of computers to monitoring uh, what is happening along the production line, uh, to keep track of the different stages of a product that is assembled in this production line, to uh, record the operation of uh, the, the, the persons that are working on the assembly line, to check whether they are becoming tired, so it is time for a break, uh, to keep with the inventory of the factory, and so on and so forth. Then there is the object diffusion of the personal computers. Uh, let's say 30 years ago, uh, buying a computer was a feat because it was very, very, very expensive, even, even if we think about a desktop machine. It was a order of magnitude uh, slower and less capable of what we have today, um, and the cost was very huge. But today, I think that everybody can afford a computer, starting from 300 euros uh, uh, and then increasing, uh, you can get a computer. Um, so, they are everywhere, and uh, they are obviously everywhere in business. Uh, if you go to a, a bank, if you go to a rental store, if you go to a grocery store, wherever you have computers. Uh, with uh, the diffusion of computer, there is also the diffusion of software, obviously. The computers are a dumb machine. Uh, unless there is a software that uh, powers them, you can do nothing with that computer. So, in parallel to the growth of the computer industry, there was the growth of the software industry. And uh, what is happening is that uh, the more the computer becomes powerful, the more the computer becomes available, well, the more we want to get from those computers. This means that the amount of software that we started deployed on our uh, computers was very little, and then it started growing continuously. Think about uh, a printer. In the 90s, a driver for a printer was about uh, 10,000 uh, uh, lines of code. LOC stands for lines of code. So it was 10,000 lines of code. Today it's about two millions. Why is that? Well, it is always the same matter of printing, so the, the task is not changed very much uh, since uh, the 90s. But the point is that today you want to have the printer accessible through the web, so you need to have a network stack running on your printer. Maybe you want to be able to send your, the picture that you take with your smartphone through Bluetooth uh, to the printer, and then you have to have a Bluetooth uh, stack there. Then you may want to have a nice display with a touch interface so that you can uh, uh, interact with the printer in a more user-friendly way. Again, you need to have uh, a dedicated software that is able to present you a very nice uh, HMI uh, to interact with the printer. Then uh, think about uh, the networked printer. Well, when you have to set up them, you don't want to mess up with uh, menus on a tiny display that you can have on the printer. So you may want to be able to configure the printer to the web. Guess what? We need to have a web server on the printer. 
So it is easy to see that the amount of software uh, to provide new services on that device grown significantly. And today we are uh, in the range of two millions of lines of code and growing. Uh, automotive is another uh, uh, important uh, um, uh, example. Uh, we have seen this uh, in the first lecture. So if we look to a modern high-end car, we have about uh, 100 millions of lines of code there. Uh, obviously, those are not running on a single embedded computer. Indeed, if you look at the electric architecture of a vehicle today, you will see that it is a distributed computing system. So you have uh, some tens of electronic control units uh, that are deployed uh, within the car. These control units uh, are uh, wired together through at least uh, one network. Um, depending on the architecture, you have multiple networks. I would say that uh, the, the simplest case uh, of um, a very cheap uh, agricultural machine uh, can bring you one network, but in a normal car, a passenger car that you may have, uh, you have at least two networks. One is a low-speed network for uh, delivering uh, the messages between electronic control units responsible for the comfort uh, of the vehicle. So, for example, when you push the button for lowering the, the window, you don't uh, directly control a, a, a stepper motor to bring down or bring up the window. It is very likely that you press the button, the button uh, originates a message that is sent to uh, a system that understands what you want to do, and this system sends another message to a small uh, smart uh, motor that is able to implement the command that you asked for. Uh, then you have another network that is a high-speed network that is intended for disseminating all the instruction, all the information, I would say, that are responsible for keeping the car moving safely. This means that you have a network between uh, the uh, braking system, the engine, the steering, the gearbox controller, the active or semi-active suspensions, and so on and so forth. So the cars today are complex devices that are uh, uh, similar to uh, a network of uh, small embedded computers. Today, it is very easy to find 20 to 30 electronic control units in a vehicle. It's a normal vehicle. Um, if you look into more advanced uh, vehicles, these numbers can increase significantly, up to 100 computers there. Um, and these are things that you don't perceive, so you don't even see that there is a computer there. Maybe you can have a perception if you have a very nice machine with uh, an infotainment system that presents you a very big display that uh, maybe presents you an Android interface. So you can guess that there is a computer there. But for the, all the other elements, you can tell. Think about the dashboard, where you have the indicators about the RPM of the engine, the, the um, odometer that gives you the speed of the car, and then all the lamps saying uh, that uh, you turn it on the lights, uh, uh, you are uh, wishing to, to steer, so you have the, the blinking uh, signal indicator of the arrow, and so on and so forth. Well, guess what? There is a computer behind that. The interface is totally different from what you were uh, expecting from a computer because it is an analog interface, but the brain is a digital brain there, and you have a computer dealing with that. So. Uh, the diffusion of computers in uh, automotive brought us to very interesting new capabilities for our vehicles. Think about the semi-active suspension. Uh, is there any of you that has uh, an Alfa Mito or Giulietta or something like that? Could you raise your hand? Few, few of you. Okay. Well, if you decided to buy the sport version of that car, you can have uh, a semi-active control of the suspensions. This means that there is a, a system made of uh, a number of accelerometers that are uh, in the key positions within the chassis of your vehicle that uh, are providing information to a computer that in real time adjusts the um, damping factor of the suspension of the vehicle so that the chassis always keeps a stable position with respect uh, to the road. 
So this is a kind of active, uh, semi-active suspension that was introduced in uh, Formula One, I think 20 years ago. So that was a very, very, very impressive device at the time, very expensive. Well, today you can afford that on a, uh, I would say, low to mid-range car. I don't want to, let's say, um, uh, um, spend bad words about uh, your Alpha Meet, okay? Uh, but uh, it is not a sport car, a very high-end sport car. This is a mid to low-range uh, sport car. So uh, this is possible thanks to the diffusion of uh, computers. And uh, you can easily understand the amount of software that is there. Um, you have, uh, I would say, 25 to 40 percent of the core of the cost of a today car that are due to the electronic and software. And uh, if you look into uh, hybrid vehicles, it is even much more than that. Then another example is an uh, airplane. Today, about uh, uh, 50 percent of the cost of a new plane is due to the software. Uh, a plane like uh, uh, the 747-800, the newest evolution of the 747, the jumbo jet, uh, is about uh, 300 uh, million euros. So half of that is due to software and hardware. So it's a big number. So what is good uh, out of software? Well, you can have uh, easily new functionalities there. It's just a matter of deploying, of deploying a new release of software. I think that here we can take a Tesla car as an example. Is there a, any of you that heard about Tesla? Okay, so Tesla is a, one of the most successfully deployed electric vehicle in the US. It's a sport car, totally electric, made by, by a crazy man, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, that is paving the way to a new uh, approach to developing vehicles. Anyway, this is a sport car. This sport car is uh, uh, obviously controlled by a huge amount of software there that is uh, regularly updated. The latest release of this software brought to the car the autonomous driving capability. So they didn't change uh, the vehicle, they didn't add a uh, new hardware feature, they didn't do nothing special, they just used in a different way what is available within the vehicle. And so they decided to push in the newest release a newest feature, the newest feature that is automotive, uh, autonomous driving capability. So this is just a software update. It is the very same that you are experiencing with uh, your smartphone. Maybe you download uh, the new version of Android, uh, you have new widgets, uh, new shading, uh, new fancy effects, and the same story. So you can uh, keep uh, up to date your device just through software. Uh, other examples could be the, um, uh, the broadcast of uh, signals. Think about uh, the telephone systems. So we have uh, 3G, 4G, LTE, all that stuff. Well, it's just a, mat a matter of software. If you have the proper antenna, if you have the proper, uh, um, uh, let's say, support from hardware, you can uh, exploit this by uploading new release of software to improve the capabilities. Sometimes it is just bug fixing. Uh, I remember when I bought uh, uh, BlackBerry uh, a few years ago, the first uh, time that I used uh, by, uh, that I started using that device, I was really, sorry for the bad word, pissed off, because it wasn't working. Uh, there was a lot of bug there. It's just a matter of downloading a new release of the firmware and everything started working perfectly. The same is happening with Tesla, just to go back to the first example that I gave you. Uh, the development model of Tesla is such that uh, the vehicle is always connected to the service center so that uh, if uh, the different users are experiencing the same misbehavior, the Tesla company is able to track down the source of the problem. If this is a bug, 
they can release a, a new version of the firmware that is uh, pushed back to the fleet of vehicles without uh, the need for you to have notice in that. When the vehicle recognizes that it is uh, safely parked uh, at home, well, the new release of the software is pushed in the vehicle, totally automatically. So this is a, an impressive uh, feature uh, due to the uh, possibility of uh, software. Another example that may um, be more, um, uh, can be closer to those of you that are like, that likes to tune uh, vehicles, you may, you may know that uh, on the market you can find uh, new firmwares for uh, making your engine more uh, capable, let's say, uh, able to give you more uh, horsepower, uh, maybe uh, able to give you a more, uh, let me say, sportish uh, driving uh, experience. This is only through the update of the software, I would say only of only few parameters uh, on the memory of your uh, uh, engine control unit. This is possible because software can be easily changed. On the other hand, as uh, any coins, there is a, uh, a flip side of the coin. Uh, we have some bad uh, things associated with software. The first of these is software is complex. No matter what, if we have uh, 100 million of lines of code, we cannot say that that software is simple. The amount of possible working conditions that can be hidden in that software are such that if you don't take the proper attention in what you are developing, you can have unintended behaviors that can have dramatic impacts. So software is complex, you can have defects there. So you have to be able to master that complexity, you have to be able to cope with those defects. The other point is that uh, a direct consequence uh, of what I just said, as the software is complex, as you have defects, when the software is, is used for uh, uh, implementing critical behaviors responsible for the correct uh, uh, operation of a system, when that software goes wrong, we can have uh, significant uh, impacts. And we will see some of them in the next uh, of this um, presentation. So let me start uh, uh, defining uh, in a very informal way the concept of safety critical systems. Uh, safety critical systems are those systems where wrong behaviors can cause casualties. So this is crucial. When dealing with safety critical systems, we don't care about money, we don't care about performance, we care about the fact that if something goes wrong, somebody dies, full stop. This is a general concept. It doesn't re um, refer only to automotive. Think about a pacemaker. Pacemaker is an implantable device that is intended for regulating the heart rate so that uh, the uh, um, heart works properly, okay? So we have done study in the past that shows that if there is a particular, uh, I would say, unlikely condition that is not properly handled by the pacemaker, the heart rate can uh, become so high that uh, you can risk uh, a heart attack just due to a failure within the pacemaker. Other example, think about, uh, well, this is uh, um, very simple because it is related to automotive. Think about uh, the software system that is responsible for uh, braking your car when you press the brake, the brake pedal. So what if uh, there is a certain lag from when you press the pedal to when the braking system actually starts working? 
there was a problem found on a uh, Jaguar uh, um, electronic control unit a few years ago. Uh, in certain circumstances, like driving 200 kilometers per hour on the highway, if you press uh, suddenly the brake pedal, um, the braking system starts working only one second and a half later. So, one second and a half at 200 kilometers per hour is a long, is a good amount of meters that you are traveling, and uh, this can make the difference between being able to safely stop or dying. So, uh, safety critical systems are those responsible for the good health of the user of the system. Uh, in order to, to give you more details about uh, these concepts, we will analyze uh, the Toyota unintended acceleration case. This is quite popular because I will see in a minute uh, uh, raised a lot of concerns about uh, uh, embedded systems deployed in vehicles and also uh, put a lot of pressures on uh, Toyota because they had to pay a huge amount of money to solve this, uh, this issue. So the bottom line of the story is that due to this unintended acceleration, uh, a certain number of models of Toyota vehicles uh, killed 89 persons uh, in the US. So let's try to analyze uh, what uh, unintended acceleration is. Uh, this is not just uh, an issue with Toyota, okay? This is a general problem. The problem is the following. Let's imagine that uh, you are driving your car, the normal condition, no particular uh, situation is happening. No matter what, uh, the car starts accelerating to the maximum speed. And uh, no matter what you are doing, the car is not able to stop. So you are in the car on uh, Corso Duca degli Abruzzi at uh, 150 kilometers per hour. That's the scenario, okay? Uh, no matter what you are trying to do, you are not able to stop the car using the normal reaction that uh, uh, you can have uh, when uh, driving. So if you try to uh, uh, remove the, your, uh, your, uh, your feet from the accelerator, nothing happens. If you try to push the brake pedal, nothing happens. Uh, as I said, this is not just a problem of Toyota. Uh, recently, there has been uh, uh, cases of unintended acceleration in General Motors and Honda models. I think that something also plugging uh, some Chrysler models, I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, the point is that, uh, as we will see in a minute, uh, the investigation resulting from the Toyota case uh, pointed out that the problem was due to software faults, lack of development process, lack of uh, usage of best practice uh, in designing this system. Um, so this is a strong signal for saying that uh, we need to take the proper attention when building such kind of systems. Uh, let me give you a bit of history of what happened here. So let's say that uh, in 2000, uh, Toyota decided to adopt uh, an electronic throttle control system, a TCS. We will see in a minute uh, what this is. Uh, then, uh, Few years after the introduction of this device, uh, these years uh, were needed to start spreading in uh, uh, high numbers uh, the vehicles that uh, were adopting these systems. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration started investigating uh, uh, the, um, uh, the number of uh, incidents that were uh, starting to grow where Toyota vehicles were used. Uh, and uh, seven years after the introduction of this system, uh, a person was killed while driving uh, his Toyota Camry. What happened here is that the vehicle started accelerating out of control uh, without uh, the driver being able to stop it. So the uh, 
the car was driving at 120 miles per hour uh, for, 20, for 23 miles before uh, hitting uh, into an accident. Uh, what is important to say is that uh, the person driving this car was a, a, a policeman. So somebody that uh, was able to, to deal with uh, high-speed driving. But there was no way of uh, stopping safely the car. So, uh, in 2010, the uh, investigation uh, eventually concluded that uh, the sudden acceleration, so this uh, unintended acceleration incidents, were linked to an issue with the vehicle electronic system. So, uh, as you can imagine, there, have been, there has been a lot of investigation here. Uh, a, a vehicle is, uh, a passenger car is a system with uh, millions of uh, components. So it is very difficult to understand uh, where the problem actually is. Uh, it took a lot of time uh, in uh, investigating all the scenarios to track down uh, the source of the problem. But uh, after uh, three years of investigation, it was possible to pinpoint the issue in the electronic system. Then, after three other years of study, um, some experts eventually uh, tracked the source of the unintended acceleration into the electronic control control system. There was a malfunctioning there. And the chain of events originated by that malfunctioning resulted in the unintended acceleration. Uh, the end of the story is that uh, at uh, due to December 2013, Toyota spent two billions dollars in legal costs. Two billions. Okay. This is uh, probably the the balance of a small uh, uh, state. Uh, they had to recall 10 million vehicles worldwide. This means that uh, they have to send. Uh, uh, a mail to all the owners of the Toyota models. Then they have to pay the cost for uh, bringing this model in-house. They have to pay the cost for repairing uh, the system and shipping this back uh, to the owner. Uh, then uh, they have to face congressional hearings to justify their case. They had to pay 65 millions on fines for violating the U.S. vehicle safety laws. Uh, and uh, in 2014, uh, they reached an agreement with the Department of Justice uh, in the U.S. Uh, that uh, required to pay $1.2 billion in uh, settlement. This is for ending a criminal investigation. So, uh, if I am not wrong, the global budget of uh, Toyota for 2014 was about four, mil four billion dollars. Okay, so 30% of the budget was spent just for uh, settling the case. So 30% is a huge number. Normally, the, the company invests, uh, let's say, something below 5% in innovation, okay? So they have to pay six times more just for settling the case due to unintended acceleration. And this is not yet the, the end of the story. There are uh, a lot of uh, lawsuits that are uh, showing up asking Toyota to uh, basically pay for what they did. So, the essence in this slide is that besides the obvious problem, uh, huge problem that uh, is happening when uh, something is going wrong on your electronic system that can result in somebody gets severely hurted or even uh, killed, there is also a huge impact on the company. So numbers like this 
if uh, happening uh, to a smaller company with not the, let's say, the power of Toyota, will end up in uh, the bankrupt of the company. So think about the Volkswagen case. This is another case pretty famous. This is not related to safety because nobody died for uh, out of that. But uh, in that case, there was an electronic system that was, let me say, tricky, um, and that was uh, able to cheat uh, on the emission of the car. Uh, in that case, uh, Volkswagen has to pay a huge amount of money to solve the problem. It is not clear yet how much they had to pay, and it is not clear if they will be able to survive out of that problem. So even a big company, when hitting this kind of crisis, can end up in bankrupt, okay? This is a significant impact on the economy. Think about them, the number of people that are working with this company. There are 100,000 people that can lose the job due to a faulty issue, due to a faulty electronic control unit. So this is something not to underestimate. Uh, here I'm showing you a slide that you don't have uh, in your material. This is something because uh, I recognize that this new slide is needed, so I inserted in the presentation, but uh, I wasn't yet able to upload the new version of the presentation. Okay, so um, sorry for this, uh, I will update this. Uh, this is uh, um, a new slide that I placed here to show you the overall uh, architecture of a powertrain system, uh, and uh, uh, I want to pinpoint you where the electronic, uh, electronic throttle control system lies. So the picture that I presented here, uh, it, you will have it uh, uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, is a schematic that uh, shows you a powertrain system. In this case, uh, is a natural gas uh, powertrain system because this is uh, the architecture of a system we, we, we are working with, but uh, it doesn't make a big difference. So, uh, here you have the engine, okay? You have the different cylinders. Then, for each cylinder, you have the injector. This is the device, the electromechanical device that uh, through a solenoid is able to control, roughly speaking, the amount of uh, fuel that is injected in the combustion chamber of your engine. Then here we have the spark plug. Uh, being this uh, a natural gas uh, system, you cannot have combustion unless you spark uh, the, the, the spark, uh, so that you start uh, the fire that corresponds to the explosion that is happening uh, in, within the combustion chamber. So this is uh, a forced combustion. This is different from the diesel engine, for example, where you have natural combustion just to the pressure in the uh, combustion chamber. So, you have Im to imagine that you have to command the injector by providing the proper amount of current for the proper amount of time so that uh, the, the needle that is controlled by, this, by the solenoid that we have here is able to move so that uh, the uh, fuel can enter the combustion chamber. And then you have to control this by triggering the uh, combustion. Uh, then you have in your system the throttle body. This is, uh, I would say, a kind of uh, movable part that uh, you can control through a proper uh, control si uh, signal, uh, and so that you can uh, uh, control the amount of uh, air that is entering in the cylinder. Obviously, to have combustion, you need to have the fuel, you need to have the air. So the electronic system decides uh, how much air should enter in the cylinder, uh, how much fuel should, end, should enter in the cylinder, and when trigger the combustion. 
uh, everything is controlled by the electronic control unit that is down here. So the electronic control unit receives from the, accelera from the um, uh, accelerator pedal the request for torque that the driver is asking to the engine. So when you press the pedal of the, acceler of the uh, accelerator, you are asking the engine to accelerate or to uh, decelerate, okay? Uh, this is the input that the driver sends to the electronic control unit. Based on the current position of the um, pistons in the cylinders, as derived by two sensors that are the crank sensor and the cam sensor, the electronic control unit is able to understand which is the current state of the engine. Then, based on the reference value asked by the driver through the accelerator pedal, and based on the current state of the engine, the electronic control unit implements a simple, I would say, closed loop control, deciding which is the correction that should be applied to the engine in order to reach the set point asked by the driver. This control results in deciding how much open this throttle body should be, how much quantity of fuel we have to inject, and when to fuel uh, the combustion. Then there are other stuff here uh, that you can see. For example, there is a, a, a sensor that is able to uh, measure the amount of uh, air that is entering in the engine. Uh, this is also able to measure the temperature of this air because uh, depending on the temperature, depending on the mass of air that is entering, uh, a special uh, correction action should be, let's say a proportional correction action should be taken. Then uh, uh, we also have uh, the control of the exhaust gas recycle valve. Uh, this is because if you want to be compliant with the Euro 6 and then Euro 7 and whatever Euro uh, emission regulation, uh, sometimes uh, you have to put uh, inside the uh, combustion chamber, the exhaust gases coming from the previous combustion cycle. This is because uh, uh, your uh, exhaust gases contains uh, too much pollutant that you want to burn again, so to reduce uh, the amount of pollutants that you insert uh, in, the, um, uh, in air. And then you have, uh, for this purpose, you have uh, the sensors that are here on the exhaust gases uh, circuit. These are the lambda sensors that are uh, uh, placed before and after the catalyst. And based on the difference of these two sensors, it is possible to understand which is the actual amount of uh, uh, pollutant that you are uh, about to um, expel. And based on, this, you, based on that, you can decide what to do with this uh, EGR valve. And then there is also feedback. So after the ECU sends the state of the system, decides the correction action, and so generate the command, the ECU is also giving uh, uh, feedback on the dashboard, showing you the fuel consumption, the number of RPM uh, of um, the engine. So uh, at the end of the story, uh, this system is uh, very similar to the control systems that you have uh, already studied in other courses. So you have a set point, you have a status of uh, the, the, the plant that you want control, then through a, con a controller, you decide which is the correction that you have to implement, okay? This is the in very, in the very um, reduced term, uh, the concept uh, that we can find here. Then it is very 
it's, the, the reality is somewhat more complex because, for example, if you, in some conditions, uh, you may have uh, um, a misbehavior of uh, the, the system here, and so you have to take proper corrective action. Um, as the, the engine is made of movable parts uh, uh, that uh, are used for years, uh, the, the signal that is coming out of the sensor here, uh, when the, the engine is shipped uh, to, the, to the user the first day of uh, the new car, uh, is uh, somewhat different than what you have 10 years later. Uh, similarly, the way in which the different injectors operate uh, is a subject to drift due to usage. And so the control system that you have here shall implement also some diagnostic capabilities to understand that the response of the system is no longer the ideal one, and so to adjust uh, uh, properly. Moreover, uh, the software that is running here has to run a lot of diagnostic uh, uh, routines uh, to understand whether there is uh, a problem that could prevent uh, the engine to work uh, correctly. And uh, this electronic control unit shall be able to tell through uh, the dashboard and through the network, uh, the vehicle network, uh, the status of the electronic control unit. You have to imagine that uh, if we say that uh, 100 is the amount of software running on this electronic control unit, uh, roughly speaking, 40% is for uh, actual uh, operation of the engine, 60% is for diagnostic purposes, to give you a rough idea. Then, coming back to our problem, we have uh, the throttle here that is uh, electronically controlled. This means that there is an electronic control unit that based on the accelerator pedal, based on the status of the engine, commands the opening or the closing of the movable part in this throttle body. The electronic control unit is this one. Uh, so we have a PCB with an automotive interface here. Then we have two big components here. The first component, the big one here, is a microprocessor. This is a kind of a main microprocessor. This is the microprocessor that reads the inputs from the sensors, decides what to do, and produces the outputs towards the actuators. In parallel to this one, there is this little guy here. This is a, a coprocessor. The coprocessor is responsible for checking the behavior of the main processor. Okay, so the architecture of the system is such that we have two processors running in parallel. One is responsible for the application. The other one is responsible for checking whether the main processor is behaving correctly or not, okay? This is something that we will see later on when analyzing uh, uh, how to implement uh, functional safety inside an electronic system. The idea is to have uh, somebody that is uh, responsible for doing an activity and then somebody else responsible for checking whether the activity has been implemented correctly, okay? This is the typical uh, scenario. Uh, so what is happening in this system? We have a scheme here. Uh, the electronic control module responsible for controlling uh, the throttle uh, takes as input uh, the pedal position. So we have a sensor here able to read uh, the, the position of the, pen, of the pedal. Then uh, it reads uh, the mass air flow uh, and other sensors and then decides how to operate an electric motor that is responsible for deciding the position of this stuff here that is able to rotate, and through this rotation, this is able to open or close the throttle valve so that the air that is incoming from the top 
is able to flow inside the, the combustion cylinders, okay? Uh, and then the electronic control module is also responsible for uh, the fuel injection and the, um, and the uh, spark plugs. So, uh, under some circumstances, this system comes into trouble. This trouble resulted in the unintended accelerator, acceleration. So what happened? Well, the problem is that uh, under this uh, unforeseeable uh, situation, uh, the throttle valve was fully open. So let's imagine that uh, the valve is uh, controllable from 0% uh, of opening up to 100% of opening. So due to this uh, problem, the, the command issued from the ACM said open the throttle valve to 100%. So this is the same that you do when you push the accelerator fiddle down to the end of the, of the trip, okay? So it's like you want to accelerate to the maximum speed. Uh, at the same time, the vehicle loss brake power assist. So uh, you are no longer able to brake the car through the brake assist that is uh, provided by the engine. This means that uh, if uh, in normal driving condition you need uh, a, a, a weight on the brake pedal to stop the car that is in the range from seven to 20 kilos, in this faulty scenario, you have to apply a weight of 80 kilograms on the brake pedal to be able to uh, slow down the vehicle. So this is a huge mass. You're not able to do that. You're not able to apply such kind of pressure on the braking pedal. This has been recorded because uh, in some uh, crashes, uh, the investigator found that the brake pedal was broken. So due to the continuous attempt of the driver, of the panicked driver to stop the car, they tried to push so hard on the brake pedal, they, they actually break the pedal. So the amount of mass that you have to place there is even uh, higher than uh, the uh, capability of the, sorry. So I was saying, the amount of, uh, of mass that you have to push uh, on the brake pedal is even higher than the tolerance, or the mechanical tolerance of the brake pedal. Uh, as a result, uh, it uh, wasn't uh, possible to stop the car anymore. Uh, now, is this something uh, that uh, maybe an experienced driver can cope with? Uh, so is there any, let me say, intuitive correction action that could be placed at work uh, uh, when you are panicked and you are experiencing this uh, driving scenario and you want to try to stop the car? Well, let's see which were the possible uh, countermeasures. Well, the first one was to uh, shift the car to neutral. Uh, if uh, you shift the car to neutral when unintended acceleration happens, the behavior of the electronic control unit is such that uh, it uh, uh, tries to control uh, the engine in such a way that uh, it is kept uh, uh, revolving, but not producing uh, any torque. Uh, but this is not uh, intuitive. You are driving, you are panicked, the car uh, is doing something that you don't want uh, it to do, and you are not able to do nothing. The last thing that you think of doing is to shift to neutral. 
<laughs> Remember in which situation we are. We are driving, we are not pushing uh, the accelerator pedal, and the car starts to accelerate to the full speed. So the last thing that you think of doing is to shift to neutral. Another, uh, uh, another action that is very typical to the computer uh, uh, world was to turn off the vehicle. So what you do when, you, when your computer hangs up? Power off, power on again, okay? Well, that was the solution for coming out of the unintended acceleration. Power off the car so that the electronic control unit stops working and then power it up again. Obviously, this is again uh, the last thing that you can think of when you are panicked, you are driving at full speed, full speed and you don't know what to do, okay? So, uh, this is the problem. How can we come out of this problem? Uh, these are the possible corrective actions. Nothing of this is intuitive. So, no way of uh, coming out of this uh, situation happily. Uh, so now, let's move on and let's see uh, which kind of investigation has been done to understand uh, deeply the source of the problem. So the point now is that we know that somebody, some, something went wrong. So we know that the car started accelerating with auto control, we know that uh, there was no intuitive way of coming out of this, but why? So those that we discussed so far are just the effects. We want to understand the root causes of this effect. So for this, a huge number of effort has been uh, spent for understanding the source of problems. I propose we have a short break and then we move on analyzing this aspect. Okay.